folks, if we could uh, come to order, please. Okay, can I, um, can I welcome everybody to this meeting of the Cabinet? Um, thanks to everybody for coming for, for their attendance. Uh, go straight into agenda item one, which is the, mem which is the Members Code of Conduct Declaration of Interest. I, I have two items um, that I need to declare an interest on, and I'll be vacating the chair and leaving the room on both of them. Uh, first one is, is item 10, designation of a neighbourhood planning forum for Birkenhead and Tranmere. I am a member of the Birkenhead and Tranmere neighbourhood planning forum, so I can declare a prejudicial interest and leave the room. And similarly, I would like to declare a prejudicial interest in item 12, Faith Services Local Authority Company Rural Evolutions Update. I'm a um, non exec director of the Board of Rural Evolutions. <coughs> And again, I'll, I'll um, vacate the chair uh, and leave the room and let um, Anne uh, chair, chair the meeting for, that, for, for both those items. Just for, for, for ease of um, uh, the running order, can I just suggest a, a slight change in the, in the order? So if we could if we could take item 11, uh, which is the Devonshire Park major plan, before 10, and then I'll go out for both, 10, for, for both that one and, and the original one. Any other any other cabinet members wish to declare any interest? Please say that. Okay. Very good. So that takes us on to item two, the minutes of the, the last meeting. Can we agree that I'll sign those minutes as a true record? Okay. Right, so that takes us on to the um, First item uh, of the agenda, which is the item number three, Rural Waters Enterprise Zone Investment Fund. Uh, I just want to say a few words about this, uh, this item. Um, I mean, I think this is a really welcome report. It's, um, I think, a very imaginative um, mechanism for getting more investment into to rural waters. The, the Enterprise Zone is obviously a hugely important regeneration site for the borough and actually for the city region um, and it's great to see that we've already got two two projects um, away now we've got the the, the new college building uh, which is uh, looking really good and the um, tower wharf contact company building which i think is due to be open very very soon now so it's, it's it's more or less completed so it's great to see those two projects but we need to um, attract clearly more investment and this is an opportunity um, through using uplifting business rates um, and or prudential borrowing against future business rates to create a, an investment fund which we can use hopefully to, to uh, attract um, potential developers and investors um, to, to do the, the infrastructure um, which will, will in turn lead to jobs and new jobs and new investment. Uh, it's, it's a tried and tested mechanism. I've, I've heard great things about the, a similar fund in one of the enterprise zones in, in West Midlands that's been very successful. So, um, you know, I think this is, um, this is a really good, uh, uh, as I say, mechanism for, for getting that, um, uh, for making that site even more attractive. Um, the business case is, is set out in the report. Um, you know, I think it, it is quite robust. For me, uh, I mean, if I just ask members to turn to table one on page four, you know, you can see the kind of uh, potential that this investment fund will um, will deliver. So, you know, for the, for the period um, up to 2037, a potentially 47 million pounds investment pot, uh, generating 10,000 jobs, 3,300 new homes, um, uh, 113.2 million business rate growth, 230,000 uh, square meters of uh, commercial floor space. So the the, uh, the prize I think for, for doing this is is really uh, really impressive, uh, and I think it's uh, it's definitely something that will enhance our, our enterprise. Uh, so I, I I simply wanted to um, recommend this this mechanism to cabinet. And if I could 
ask you to turn to the recommendations on page 8 and 9 um, to, to move those recommendations. And obviously, um, I think there are, you know, as the report says, we will be looking at each proposition on a case by case basis, which I think is, is absolutely right. But I think this is, this is something that is a really innovative um, way of, of uh, levering in more, more funding uh, and, more, and more investment into World Wars. So I'm happy to uh, recommend to Kevin that we accept those recommendations. Can we agree that? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so moving on to item four, which is the statement of accounts for 2014-15. Um, Okay, so clearly this, this is a, these accounts have been through audit and risk management committee. Um, I think I would just like to flag up a couple of points. Uh, I mean, first of all, paragraph 2.5 on page 12, um, the, the accounts report uh, a revenue underspend of 0.5 million uh, the year end, uh, the year end, a balance of 18.8 million. Um, my, my comment on this is, you know, what a contrast with the position that we found ourselves in in 2012 when we took over from the previous administration. And in the first three months, we found ourselves with an overspend of 17 million, uh, but we're now reporting, uh, you know, an underspend for the 14, 15. So I think it just shows the progress that we've made around getting the council's finances onto a stable footing in that three-year period. So I think, I think that's a, a really good, good outcome. And, and you know, my thanks to um, you know, members and officers who've worked hard to um, make sure that we've got a robust financial platform uh, for moving forward. I think mean, that's really good. And I think uh, if you look at the, the, um, the audit uh, report, it's, I think, very positive. Um, you know, the, um, all the five areas of assessment um, uh, have been rated as green, and also if you look at paragraph 2.8, the, uh, the Grant Fund and our external auditors um, report that we are um, in, in a, um, we've got good arrangements in place for securing economy, efficiency, and um, effectiveness. And also very positive comments in paragraph 2.10. Uh, around improvement in strategic financial planning and financial control. And I'm really pleased that they also acknowledge the, um, uh, the improvements that we've, uh, we've made as a result of the, the rural plan, the 2020 plan, which I think is, um, is, is, is good that they've, they've mentioned that. So I think a very positive uh, report there on the statement of accounts. Um, where if I take it to page 14, the recommendations in paragraph 13, so we're being asked to note the statements of accounts for 2014-15 and Grant Thornton's uh, audit findings report, and also to agree that progress on delivering the actions identified in the audit report uh, will be monitored by the Audit Risk Management Committee, and, and my thanks to them for the work that they've done um, on, um, on, the, on these accounts as well. So can I move those recommendations? Yeah, yeah Anne, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've 
yielded from the treasury management uh, work uh, around cash flow balances, um, uh, which which has meant that we don't have to uh, borrow externally. I think that's a, that was a really good um, outcome. Um, and I think we just need to say we need to continue the, the good work. And um, obviously, the, the aim is to uh, achieve a balanced budget by the end of the financial year. But I think we're well on, on track to do that. The only other uh, point I was going to make, um, and we've, we've covered this before, but I think it's worth reiterating if you look at page 24, paragraph 3.2.7, um, you know, sadly, the government uh, announced an in the year cut for public health of. Um, uh, around 2 million, it's actually 1.9 million has been confirmed. Now, you know, I've said on many occasions, um, bad enough having future years uh, savings that we're going to make, but to actually, uh, for the government to actually impose an in year uh, cut in our budget is, just puts us local authorities in an impossible position because you've already set your budget for the year, you've commissioned contracts, you've got organisations geared up to deliver. Uh, you know, key outcomes, and then halfway through the year, the government says, "Well, actually, we're going to cut your budget by two million. I mean, I just think that's a, a really, um, actually, I think it's a disgraceful way to, um, an irresponsible way to uh, for the government to um, to manage its its finances. So, um, you know, I think we just need to highlight that. I know we are working hard to try and mitigate the impact of that in year. Cut, but um, I, I just don't think that's helpful, and I, I, I really, really hope that in the forthcoming kind of autumn statements, uh, the comprehensive spending review, the, the autumn statement, we don't have any, any more in year cuts because it will just add to the, uh, the, the, the difficulties that we've got. However, having said all of that, um, you know, I think the, um, the, the, the picture thus far is, is pretty good, but we need to continue to bear down on any overspends. So, so that would be my comment on, on this report. So just ask the Cabinet to uh, look at recommendations in paragraph 17, page 29. Uh, so paragraph uh, 17, 1 uh, talks about the improvement of 2.2 million in the 15 16 uh, revenue budget position during quarter two. Uh, be noted, and I would say and welcome, because we, we've, we've reduced the, the overspend. Uh, and the officers quite rightly continue to identify actions and measures to reduce uh, the overspend of 0.7 million as it now and to mitigate against any media funding reduction for public health and replenish general fund balances. So, can we do those recommendations? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so that takes us then to item 6, which is the capital monitoring report for quarter 2. Um, and again, uh, we're uh, looking at a capital program uh, which is just over 50 million for 1516. Um, expenditure base is 18.2 million. Um, I would just like to again reiterate the, um, the good work around the use of internal borrowing, to, to, which means that we haven't uh, had to uh, borrow externally. And obviously, every time you, you borrow externally, there's a revenue implication for that. So by not having to do that, that saves the revenue budget, which is a you know, <coughs> which has helped us with our um, uh, the, the, the picture in terms of the, um, uh, the the year end. So I think that's really good work that we've managed to use our um, our internal cash balances to uh, mean that we haven't had to borrow externally. Uh, which is really good. There's also some, I, you know, I think it's really important to, to mention there's some really good projects here, capital projects, uh, which are generating uh, really important outcomes for our local residents in terms of improving um, you know, the, um, uh, the health of the, the local population. Um, there's some, some really good work around um, providing grants to businesses, which, which is mentioned. Um, and um, uh, I think you know, the capital program is, is, is really working well uh, thus far. But I don't know if there are any individual cabinet members who may want to pick up on some of those points. So, can I start with Chris? And I'll go to you, Chris. Thank you, Jay. Um, I'd just like to comment on Ingrid Abbas, which uh, obviously is in my board, and the absolutely fantastic fitness that we've done here is there now, and that the EFT has, has been wonderful from the local population as well as the wider community 
Um, and I'd just like to say I know that fits in with some of our pledges um, around health and fitness. Great. Chris? Good, Chris? Took the words right out of my mouth there. Um, you know, I'd just like to say uh, any gap that's not only really improving the health of the people, but it's actually improved the health of the local authority because the revenue's gone up. We've got more people who join the gym there. The gym is absolutely fantastic. We've got the same happening in West Kirby. Our the great membership is this on through the roof now. We're competing really well with the private sector out there. <coughs> the other thing I'd like to say is the West Kirby Marine Lake, I mean, uh, plans will be going through shortly enough for the Marine Lake there. Thanks to Sports India, we've had a grant accepted by them and they're going to help us with the refurbishment of Marine Lake. So it's, it's really good news out there for people in Melbourne. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Just with regard to the number that we page 38, uh, 3.10, uh, where it talks about touches on the regional growth fund, which says additional grant will be received to match expenditure related to this particular regeneration activity. And the five million has been provided uh, from this one, the growth funds to provide investments and assist with the regeneration of development of local businesses. You, you, you will recall as well the Glasgow Council, um, I read out a list and swathe of um, schemes right across the board. Tremendous amount of schemes, tremendous amounts of uh, activity happening uh, actually in the pipeline already, already started. Uh, great jobs, uh, bring people's quality of life and making a real, real difference. And this fund has really helped in that respect in terms of match and in, in a lot of other ways. Um, particularly helping small businesses um, with it, and, and meeting our targets as well within the 2020 plan and also, of course, uh, achieving our job targets, which I believe we're going to surpass. Than expected. But all in all, uh, I think with this particular form, it's made a big difference for the world. Tony and then Stuart, I'll do it for a Stuart, Stuart first. We've got the LED program on page 36 of the table, too. Uh, that project's well on the way now. Seven, Treasury Management Monitoring Mid-Year 
2015 and 2016. Um, again, I, I just, and this is a thing that's run uh, through quite a few of these reports so far on the finances, the, the 2.5 million underspend in 1516, um, and particularly the, the great work that's been done by our colleagues in, in finance about, as I say, using internal uh, funds within the council to minimise the need to externally borrow, and um, that, that's uh, generating an overall saving of £3 million. Pounds. So I think that's a, that's a really good, really good outcome. So I don't really want to say anything more than that because we could vote but many of these issues in, in uh, last few reports, but just to ask you to turn to recommendations in paragraph 13, page 64, that the Treasury Management Performance Management Report be accepted in meeting our obligations under the Treasury Management Code. Can we, can we read that recommendation? Thank you very much. Right, so that takes us then to uh, item 8, which is the Budget Council uh, Arrangements. Uh, so this sets out um, the budget council and agenda procedure um, for for the um, budget uh, that we set for um, 16, 17 and beyond. Um, it talks about some of the key dates um, uh, that we uh, we've agreed now. So the um, budget council will now take place on Thursday the third of, of March, with the reserve dates on Wednesday the 9th of March. Um, you will see that um, the, uh, the agenda and budget council procedure set out in Appendix 1 um, uh, to, in this report. So I'm being asked to agree with that. And also, finally, um, that the Head of Legal and Management Services be authorised to make uh, changes, any changes to the budget council agenda and or procedure um, set out in Appendix 1 um, are providing the agreement of all three party leaders has been obtained. So I'll simply move those, those recommendations. And we refer that to council. Yeah. Is, that, is that good? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so uh, item nine is uh, a series of important papers and reports around some changes to the executive arrangements um, and pledge champions. I'll, I'll talk about the pledge champions particularly. Uh, but I just would like Sergi to just maybe introduce this paper because clearly, you know, this will involve some changes to our constitution. I think it's it's appropriate for head of law to uh, just to introduce this report. So just going to hand over to Sergi. Thank you, Chair. Just just to clarify, the, the changes to the constitution are in fact um, very minimal, um, not least because the executive was just formed and uh, under the government's arrangement of the law, strong leader powers. The report before you effectively looks to um, seek your approval for the revisions to the cabinet portfolios um, and some details of the cabinet member appointments. Um, confirm. It also makes some minor changes to the role of the cabinet as set out in Article 7 of the Constitution. There are no proposed changes to the actual governance arrangements under what's been proposed. Um, Council uh, in 2009 essentially addressed those issues. Um, and so there's no changes to the actual executive arrangements, it's just purely the role of the cabinet which does fall within the strong uh, arrangement in terms of executive <coughs> infrastructure. Um, likewise, there are changes being proposed to the scheme and delegation of executive functions to cabinet members and to officers, and again, that falls within the uh, strong leader powers and responsibilities under the regulations. Um, as part of the review, the papers uh, you have in front of you also suggests a revision to the cabinet committee reports and minutes templates. Uh, and again, I'll come on to the rationale and reason for that in a few moments. Uh, and likewise, a change to the cabinet meetings uh, that probably take place in the evening, but to daytime meetings. Uh, and also, a suggestion with regards to those champions. Chair, uh, the, the reason for this particular, uh, these changes being proposed would essentially stem from the fact that the council in July has approved this little plan. Um, and essentially, in order to ensure that the delivery of that plan can be ensured, uh, these changes will enable decisions to be taken uh, at greater pace. It will ensure that the openness and transparency of those decisions is maintained, uh, that Cabinet has a more strategic focus and, has a, and will deal with more high profile, more significant matters, um, and members will be able to exercise broader delegated executive powers of the scheme. But that doesn't mean that members can't bring matters to Cabinet should they so wish. So that opportunity for Cabinet to still be the decision maker still vests with both yourself as leader of the council and also the cabinet members and the delegated powers. Uh, and 
and equally that applies to oxygen emissions. Uh, in terms of the carbon reports, um, there's some notable changes in terms of uh, first reference we look at the members and the codes in particular, with the recommendations and the small narrative around the report, uh, featuring prominently as part of the front end of the report with the usual implications, etc., appearing in the, the latter part of the report. And that again is to ensure that it's um, for those who wish to follow the decisions of the cabinet and the executive, uh, particularly on the website and using the market system that we have, they're able to uh, identify subject matters quickly, identify the decision that's been taken with this very quick narrative. Um, so it hopefully will become more user friendly for anyone wishing to follow any decisions that are taken by the cabinet. So that was principally the reasons for why the changes were being proposed. With regards to cabinet meetings, likewise, uh, we've seen as part of a bigger agenda with regards to the way in which we do uh, cover and administer executive decisions. Um, the idea being that by bringing them into the daytime it will be more efficient and less costly for the organisation in administering committee meetings and cabinet meetings rather in the evening. Um, and it's, it's, it varies up and down the country in terms of which level of function you go to, it does, it's a practice that does vary um, and it's seen as an opportunity for us to look at and reflect upon that uh, and it's recommended that we actually now have these meetings, cabinet meetings Ten o'clock on Mondays, um, which is seen as, as I say, more, more cost-efficient way of administering cabinet meetings. Uh, and finally, Chair, the, the, the pledge champions uh, again linked uh, directly to the group planning the 20 pledges. Um, as the report indicates, it's there to have the job role itself. It's, it's, the pledge champions do not have any executive powers or responsibilities. You can't delegate any uh, such powers to them. There's no allowances paid to these particular roles either. Uh, it is there for the, the opportunity for the pledge uh, champion to raise the profile uh, and engage in a variety of activities to support the delivery of that particular pledge and they will work closely and in conjunction with the executive member uh, as appropriate as well as assist possible performance committees and so on as necessary in order to ensure and help with the successful delivery of the plan. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Sergio. Now, if I could just kind of add to that, I don't want to repeat what you said because I think you summarised the the, the, the reasons why we were making these changes, but I think, I think you know, the message needs to go out. That, you know, the, the administration is absolutely determined that we will deliver our plan and the 20 pledges, and these changes are to uh, enable us to to do that, and um, you know, to not just maintain the pace, but to maybe if, if, if anything, increase the pace around those pledges because you know those those are key outcomes that will benefit our residents and businesses and the, um, the changes in the cabinet members' uh, portfolios, uh, uh, job descriptions are very much um, to align with the, um, the pledges in the, the, the 2020 plan. Um, so I think that's really important that we make that point. And of course, just to reiterate the point that's made in the uh, document, this is not just a rural council plan, this is a plan that's been signed up by, to, by all our partners. Um, so this is the plan for the whole world and everybody uh, is on board and eight of the 20 pledges are being led by uh, organisations outside the council. So it's very much a, a rural PLC effort this rather than just, just the council on its own. I think it's important to, 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 uh, to make that point. Um, the only other thing I wanted to, to just um, make, make some comments on, and you can see the um, the, the cabinet portfolios and the um, there's no change in the cabinet lineup, um, so so they, they basically the, um, the personnel stay the same, uh, but slight changes in the uh, job descriptions. But the other thing I want to just allude to is the um, the pledge champions. So just a, a few words, um, you know, Sergio, you can kind of introduce this, but again, this is to uh, help us deliver the 20 pledges in an even more effective way. Um, so these uh, champions will be uh, will play a key role working very closely with the relevant cabinet member um, and um, officers and, and partners to, to to make sure that we are you know we are delivering those those key pledges, those 20 pledges. You know to look at look for best practice as well uh, to bring that back into to rural. Um, and I think it is important to emphasise that formally they are not part of the executive and they are not, they're not getting any special responsibility allowance. 
this is this is a, something that they're doing as part of their duties um, as a, a as an elected member. But I do think it, it will add more. Um, it will help uh, us as a cabinet to to uh, deliver our, on, on these twenty pledges. So what I will also like to announce tonight is who the champions are. Um, I've produced a, a sheet um, which Andrew you can you can get out, which actually sets out who the, the, the each of the uh, champions are for the 20 pledges, and um, you know I'd be asking Cameron to formally um, formally agree this, um, and I think uh, the, uh, the, the I know that the people that, would, that I'm nominating for these positions will do an excellent job in, in working with the relevant portfolio holder to deliver each of these pledges. So um, it is it is a new role, but, but one I think that will, will um, help us deliver our. So um, I think that's that's the, the, all I wanted to say. Um, just to, to, to ask you to, to look at the recommendations in paragraph 14, uh, page 78. Um, so we we we're noting the revised capital portfolios, uh, and I'm confirming the government members as set out on page 81, appendix one. Uh, we agree. We are agreeing the cabinet meetings from January to be held on Monday at 10 o'clock. Uh, I think this will save money. It means we won't be dragging um, kind of lots of officers in the evenings. Uh, I think that will save money. And, and it's not uncommon. I know a number of the authority, other authorities in the side already hold cabinet meetings in the daytime. Uh, so I think it will enable us to be more efficient. Um, we, we're, we're noticing the revised role of cabinet and. Um, the, the Article 7, Article 7 of the Constitution, which we put to form the Vert Council. Just fully in Yeah, um, uh, that's fine. The scheme of delegation of executive functions to cabinet members and the scheme of delegation of functions to officers, which will take effect from, um, from this month. Um, and that we, fourthly, we approve the revised cabinet committee reports formats um, and the, the cabinet agenda and cabinet committees minutes, templates, and agree that they be applied as soon as possible. Um, and then finally, we approve the creation of the pledge champions, um, uh, the, the job description set out um, in Appendix 6, and I formally moved the, the 20 names which are circulated um, tonight, um, uh, so that each of those pledges within the rural plan can can be delivered um, even more timely than, than, than we, are, we have had previously. And so I'd like to, um, to move all those recommendations, but particularly ask you to confirm uh, both the cabinet members and also the pledge champions. So can I move those, those recommendations? They agree. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Right, okay. So I'm now going to ask us if we could go to item 11. Just slightly changing the order, running over here, um, which is the neighbourhood planning report, uh, the making of a neighbourhood plan for Devonshire Park. Um, I can ask Pat, Pat to introduce us, please. So thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just give you just a little bit of background. A local referendum uh, on the making of a statutory neighbourhood development plan for Devonshire Park was held on the 22nd of October um, this year. 92% of the 303 people who voted voted in favour of the council using the Naval Development Plan to help uh, decide the planning applications in Devonshire Park. This report therefore recommends that the Naval Development Plan for Devonshire Park attached to the report is made by a resolution of full council. The council chair is now obliged by law to make the proposed neighbourhood development plan part of the statutory development plan for will by resolution of full council, uh, section 38A of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 uh, Before I come to the recommendations, can I thank the uh, community in this area for all the hard work that they've done uh, and have carried out because I know it is a lot of hard work for them in these areas and we give the heart and soul into it. I know we've been involved in a lot of 
similar uh, type of, of um, work in my own world uh, over the years. I don't know how much, as I say, actually put in. So, uh, you know, particularly with the, with the referendum, because it was overwhelming, 92%, uh, which I think is, uh, is a clear indication that we really wants this. Um, so, again, the, the bank, and also, in the right sense, the first on the world, yeah, uh, this plan. The recommendations. Do you want to read out the recommendations here? Yeah. I think I think we could we can see them. Yeah, so we can and can the recommendations Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Can I add my um, my thanks to particularly the, the residents, um, you know, who, I know in Devonshire Park who, who worked really hard to uh, to come up with this plan. And you know, it is a very innovative um, initiative really and, and, and as you say, it's the first one in the world, so it'd be really interested to see how this develops over time. So happy to, to endorse your uh, moving of those recommendations. Can we agree that, Carol? Agree. Great. Okay. Right. At this point, I'm going to vacate the chair and let I um, take over. Thanks to you. Thanks very much.
Yeah. Yeah, the recommendation are that the Trame, the Vietnam Trame, they will plan for the formally designated as the statutory naval plan for for the naval area of Vietnam Trame shown in and it's one to this uh, report subject to the revised constitution uh, attached as uh, appendix three of this report and that the designation and the uh, associated documents are published in accordance with the regulation 10 of the naval planning general regulations 2012 that's the uh, recommendation which i hope uh,